All right, we are going to stream. There. So I, uh, on Monday, I, I tried to raise some money for the SETI Institute. I hope, uh, I hope all the donations came through. Uh, Beth, I, um, someone asked me, what is the ratio between spending on, um, there optical telescopes. So I, uh, oh, hold on, on Monday, I, I tried right. to, so what is the, what is the ratio between spending on optical telescopes and SETI? And I said, it is infinity to zero. Yeah. <laughs> And then encouraged everyone to go and uh, and and become members of the SETI Institute and and provide some donations. So, like I said, cool. yeah. Hopefully, again, if it works and we discover aliens, you're welcome. <laughs> Job security. Job security. We did it. We found aliens, and it was all thanks to people watching Fraser on that Monday. Oh, low those many years ago. Hey everyone, um, it's time for you to say hello to me, and then I will say hello back. And by hello, I mean, like, say hello in the chat. Don't just say hello while you're watching your YouTube because I can't hear that. All right. Yeah, I need more people. There's like not enough people there to say hello to yet. So I'm going to need more people to say hello in the in the chat. But at least we're live. It's, this is actually functioning. So just to let everyone know how this is going to go, today's going to get a little different because we have an interview that we've actually been sitting on for about a month. And you got a preview um, from Nick uh, Cohen. We did a uh, Cowan. We did a interview with him and his uh, compatriot at McGill, and and then I we were them really busy with live guests. And so we're finally getting a chance to play that, that interview. So the interview is going to take about, it's, it's a long one, actually, it's about 18 minutes. So we're going to end the main show around at around the 45 minute or the 40 minute mark ish, and then switch over into the actual, um, uh, that part of the, uh, the interview. And it's a great interview. So I think you'll, you'll really enjoy it. Um, all about exoplanets. A very clever idea with exoplanets, which I really liked. Um, and then, uh, yeah. So, and if you don't want, and then, it, and then later on, editors will move it magically into the middle of the episode, and it'll sound completely uh, normal. Um, okay, now, now I'm ready to say hello. Hello to Alex Despland, Andy Cowley, Astro B, Bob Moeller, David Dunn, David Fairweather, Gina Rodkey. Grant Lanning, Ian Farkeron, John Suffield, Johnny J, Kira H, Larry Beckham, uh, Johnny Z, uh, Martin Bradshaw, Nancy Graziano, Paranor, Susie Murph, Therese, Tim Bargan, and Zapfan Zapfan. I think some people snuck in there. Uh, Horizon Brave, Grant Lanning, if I haven't, didn't already say your name, then I just said it a second time. All right. Shh. Everyone's so quiet be like Halloween. Did you all see all of the uh, all of the spooky NASA pictures this week for Halloween? They always do that every year. I've seen a couple like, today. It was like the ghost in the Perseus Veil. Vale. I think I saw that one. Yeah, they run that one. And then they had a, a shot of the sun with a bunch of sunspot activities on it that kind of looked like a jack-o'-lantern. I saw that one. Yeah. And then there was like a colliding galaxy that looked sort of like a ghost skull or something like that. So I'm suitably terrified of space now. Thanks, NASA. <laughs> All right, we've hit the five minute mark, so it's time to begin the show. Uh, the two guests are out of frame. I understand, John, the, they will be properly in frame when we shift to the other mode. We don't use this one very much. See, this is, this is what they look like when, when they're full screen. All right, to me. Get my intro. Hello and welcome to the Weekly Space Hangout for Wednesday, October 30th, 2019. One day before Halloween. I'm Fraser Kane, publisher of Universe Today. This week, we're going to be talking about the smallest dwarf planet yet. Uh, is the supermassive black hole in our galaxy uh, hiding a wormhole? and uh, more information on the crisis in cosmology. 
Um, and we've got a, an interview with uh, Evelyn McDonald and Nick Cowan from Cohen Cowan from uh, McGill University. So uh, stick around for that. Joining me this week on my screen right now is uh, Beth Johnson from the Study Institute. Beth. Yes. Hi. Wait. There. Say that again. Hi, everyone. <laughs> now you're on the screen as opposed to just this, this voice from, uh, from afar. <laughs> Uh, we've also got uh, Michael Roderick. Michael. Hello. Thank you for having me again. Oh, wait. There we are. All right. Third. This is your third, right? You're, you're a veteran uh, now, I think. Third. Yeah. yeah. Third, I think. Yeah. Excellent. Getting on there. Yeah. Yeah. Um, and then we've also got uh, Brian Coberlin. Brian. Hi, everybody. All right. So before we get into all of the... Uh, stories this week, I want to give everybody a big reminder uh, to go and take a moment and join the Weekly Space Hangout crew. This is, of course, the community, our friends, our producers, the executive producers of this show. They make this thing possible in every way, shape, and form. So if you want to be a member of the, of the crew, go to wshcrew.space. They will give you access to the behind the scenes Slack channel, the one that's showing up on the screen right now. They've got a discussion forum and they've got uh, a way for you to make your own business card so that you can say that you're an executive producer of the Weekly Space Hangout. They uh, give you uh, templates so that you can reach out and tell people, astronauts, astronomers, that you are a executive producer of the Weekly Space Hangout and invite them on the show. It's easy, it's fun, and uh, then you can have us invite, uh, interview the guests that you want to see on the show. So go to the Weekly Space Hangout crew, wshcrew.space. All right, let's get into this week's stories. Brian, you're on my screen. Uh, now, I saw the story about the wormhole at the middle of the of the galaxy, uh, the possibility of the of the wormhole, and I was like about to assign the story to you uh, for Universe Today, and I'm like, no, that would just like I just I couldn't do it. I I he would just be mad and sad, and then what do I see on your uh, on your blog? Uh, there's a story about the wormhole at the center of the supermassive yeah. black. So literally, yeah. you clearly have absolutely a full willingness to talk I have about no shame. Oh, no shame. All topics, no matter how theoretical, um, you know. You uh, so so you brought this on yourself. Tell I us did. about the wormhole at the center of the galaxy. <laughs> so we're going to talk about wormholes. I need a sheet of paper. You know, that's what you, you got always a pen? have to have. Yeah. And, and, and you fold it and you poke a hole in it and say, that's what a wormhole is. It's a shortcut through space. Uh, so to give you come, just a basic background of, of wormholes, they were originally proposed by Einstein and Rosen, which is why they were called an Einstein-Rosen bridge. They were basically trying to figure out what happens when, uh, you know, if you have a black hole, all that matter collapses to a singularity, a point. You're basically dividing by zero. What happens? And so one of the ideas is that, well, maybe it, it crosses and extends. Why would, why would space-time stop there? You know, and this was starting this whole idea of, of perhaps being able to extend through a black hole. You would get to the other side and there would be a white hole. And, and way back in the early days of relativity, Einstein and Rosen proposed this. It went absolutely nowhere because it didn't make sense. Um, it sprung back up in theories when we had a model for rotating black holes. And that's because rotating black holes, are their, their space-time structure is more complex. And they don't actually have a, a single point singularity. And so there was this whole way to kind of maybe you could map through that. Maybe you could go through a rotating black hole and end up on the other side. And, you know, there's, there's a lot of problems with it, but, but you can't fully resolve it because depending on how you approach the, this metric, what they call this, the structure of space-time the metric, depending on how you approach it, you could consider this idea of, of possibly having these kind of wormholes. So, so then, they got into favor again back in the, I think the 90s, um, 
contact had a thing with wormholes because maybe you could use wormholes to go to, uh, you know, distant stars and stuff. Now, when you and, say in favor, do you mean in favor among science fiction writers or in favor among physicists? In, in favor among theoretical physicists. Okay. So, so they, they come in trends, basically, you know, theorists love to basically push a theory until it breaks. So, so, okay, the rules say this. Okay, well, what if I break those rules? What happens? And so there was this whole thing of you'd learn something more about black holes and then you'd apply new tools to it. So I mean, just I'm, as an example, sorry. So like, like a white hole, right? A white hole is, if I understand it, it is what happens if you take the math of, of a black hole and push it to the limit, right? Yeah, you can kind of think of it as, as like a black hole inside out like if you turn your t-shirt inside out that's, right so that's what if you turned hole. this number negative what would that do and then you get yes. something weird and then yes. you go okay great can we see that weird thing out there in space and then the answer exactly. to that is you know, so, probably not so there are no observed white holes um you know and and so and and the idea of a wormhole is still purely theoretical so so this has fallen in and out of favor so why why come back to this again well the reason wormholes were really kind of pushed aside after a while is that basically it was proven that you could never have a wormhole you could travel through unless you had some type of magic matter. You know, they call it exotic matter, but basically I just need magic pixie dust. If you give me magic pixie dust, I can make a wormhole, but, but you can't go through it. Right. And so, well, then it's, it's kind of useless for science fiction and useless for theoretical physics. And so it fell out, but but traversable means a very specific things. It means you can physically go through it. And that's not the same thing as, as some type of force having an influence. And so what this new paper was looking at is if you had a wormhole in, in kind of the, the standard model of a non-traversable wormhole, if could gravity interact through that? And, and the answer according to this paper is yes. You can have, you can have gravitational effects, even though you can't move matter through this wormhole. If you have this wormhole and here's a black hole and a white hole, if you have mass on this side, the gravity of that mass can affect something out here outside the black hole. And so even if, for example, your, your, your black hole and your wormhole and the one end of the wormhole is halfway across the galaxy, the gravity could be going through the wormhole halfway across the galaxy. Right, because according to the wormhole, they're not halfway across right. the galaxy. Now, the structures are they're very close together. Now, this question is going to get a little weird. So, would you be experiencing the gravity twice? Like, you know, if you've got the, or are you, or are you just experiencing the gravity? So, if say you've got instead of it being halfway across the galaxy, you've got the black hole, you've got the wormhole, and say it's it's out of the distance of Pluto. And so normally the gravity would be a lot more intense, but now you're out of the, now your wormhole is out at the, at the other end of the distance of Pluto. And so you're right. experiencing the strong gravity, but then you're also experiencing the gravity that's coming from the black hole in other directions, getting all the way out to the distance of Pluto, or would it like occult? I'm just wondering if you create some kind of gravity feedback loop to the universe. No, you wouldn't, you wouldn't get a gravity feedback loop. Right. And, and the reason is because gravity isn't, isn't a linear theory. So we think of it like gravity is like charge. And, and if I put a charge somewhere and I put another charge and another charge, you just add them all up and that's the solution to how much charge you feel. And, and with gravity, it's not. You have to put all the masses where they are and then you find the solution because they don't add up one for one. You can't just add one and add one and add one. Right, okay, so, okay. So you would have this influence, but it wouldn't magnify. But, but what it means is that if you can then distinguish, at least in theory, between a supermassive black hole that is just a black hole by itself and a supermassive black hole that is a wormhole. And the reason is because if it's a wormhole, if there's matter on that other side, it would pull anything near the black hole. So if you have the supermassive black hole in our galaxy, there's a star called SO2 that orbits really closely. And every now and then it goes really close to the black hole. Well, if it's a wormhole, 
then the orbit of that would deviate from what general relativity says. And, and in principle, they do the basic calculations that after a few times, you could see this difference. The difference would be measurable. And so, but that's not, that's not replacing the black hole with the other end of a wormhole, right? That is no. having a, the other end of a wormhole, say, in orbit around the black hole, and it would sort of provide... No, it would, be, it would mean that the black hole would be a wormhole that went wherever. And, and it doesn't matter where it goes, because through the wormhole, the wormhole white hole connection is actually short. Right. It's, it's like roughly the width of from the event horizon to an equivalent one. And so, so do, I mean, do we so do we have that capability? Like, would you do that with the event horizon telescope when it takes its picture of the or when they finally process the picture of, of Sag A star? So what you would need to do is you would need to see how close orbiting stars were affected by gravity. So you need multiple orbits. So this is something that would take decades to watch the orbit of SO2 to see if it actually, uh, if its orbit processes in a way that we can measure. Wow. So, so they're saying in, you know, six to eight orbits, I think, um, you would be able to detect the difference if, if there's a wormhole and if there's stuff on the other side of the wormhole close to it. But even so, even if it is, you can't go through it. Only no. with gravity. Well, you can go through it and you get crunched. Or, and the wormhole. So you, don't, you wouldn't go all the way through. You would just go to the black hole. Right, right. And also the wormhole would collapse though, right? Like, right. like anything going into the wormhole would collapse it. Right. It, it, it's not traversal. You can't go through and, it. And don't things go into black holes? And if yes. gravity is, if the gravity is, you know, wouldn't that, if that gravity is going through the wormhole, then wouldn't that create a really nice additional three body interaction that would potentially send stuff careening down into that throat of that wormhole. That that's an interesting idea that wasn't explored. Yeah. Yeah. I just so, wondering like so they were just looking at gravity, being able to traverse it and how in principle you could use that to, to prove a right. white, a, a wormhole versus a black hole. Right. And so no mechanism for how it could possibly exist, no mechanism for how it could possibly stay stable, just if I feel like the sprinkling of the pixie dust has returned. Yeah, the, the, the thing that they didn't do is that they didn't, they didn't sprinkle pixie dust to make it transversible, traversable. Right, so, right. So you could have pairs form. You know, in the early universe, if you say that there, there's parts of the early universe we don't know, there are things that we don't understand about quantum gravity. We, we know that like particles can appear in pairs. So, so they're assuming that something could create this structure, which according to general relativity is valid. If, if you can make that structure, right. according to general relativity, that's possible. That doesn't mean that they exist. It just means it doesn't violate the mathematics of relativity. And so you could have a situation where, I mean, like one of the proposals for how you could actually have primordial black holes is that they could have formed back in the early universe when space time was all tangled up in, and you had over densities in areas where you could end up with a, with a tiny black hole. And, and that's right. proposed another time when you maybe could get those kinds of structures and then they were spun out into the universe. Right. So there could be primordial black holes that were in fact wormholes that this technique could be used on. Right. Right. Yeah. So this I, whole... I find it an interesting idea because it, it brings wormholes to some level of testability. Go, go ahead, Michael. Uh, so I was going to ask about the, the white hole, the idea that you have stuff coming out of the black hole, out of through the black hole into the other exit it does imply then that something was able to go through it so then are white holes completely not possible according to this theory that you can't send anything through a black hole so so it depends it depends on how you deal with the structure of relativity one way to get around that is to say they don't connect to our universe they connect to another universe that looks like a white hole from our universe but from their universe it's a black hole <laughs> And it's time reversed. And so ours looks like a white hole. You can you can make it so that you would never see white holes. 
Okay. But, you know, again, this is all, you know, we can make the theory work if you give us enough things to just assume. <laughs> That's awesome. Um, all right. Uh, Michael, uh, speaking of things that uh, need to work, uh, give us an update on the crisis in cosmology. So it's a crisis that's been going on for a very long time. So the trouble is we don't know exactly how fast the universe is expanding. There's two groups that are consistently getting different numbers and we don't know how to make them agree. So there's one group of scientists who they want to measure how fast the universe expands by finding out how far away something is from us, what is its redshift, can we use that to then determine the expansion of the universe. And so we've done this with uh, stars called Cepheid variables. These are stars that have a relation to how bright they are and how often they flicker. So they go bright to dark to bright to dark. And by measuring the relation between uh, those periods, you can figure out how bright it is. You can actually measure it, then you can get an idea for how far away it is and then you can measure Hubble constant that way. You can look at supernovae. These things are luminous across the entire, well, for a pretty good chunk of the universe. They blow up, we can see them from very far away. We can get their redshift, figure out how far away they are. And there's kind of a new way of trying to figure out Hubble's constant, and that is using um, gravitational lensing. So the idea is that you have a quasar, which is far off, Way in the distant universe and it happens to have a galaxy in front of it between it and us and so the mass of that galaxy will actually bend the light of that quasar around it and so you end up getting this ring or a cross pattern of this lens quasar and so by doing a bunch of math and kind of figuring out the relative size of the or the angular size of the quasar versus the lensing galaxy, you can directly measure Hubble's constant. And so these three ways, using Cepheids, uh, supernovae, and now lensing, they all seem to agree with each other pretty well. Then you go over to using the cosmic microwave background, using things like Planck and WMAP, and they're getting an answer that is just a little bit off. So Supernovae and lensing people are getting about 72 kilometers per second per megaparsec, which means every megaparsec you go out, you, you're expanding you know, 70 kilometers a second faster. The WMAP people are getting about 68. And so it's you know trying to figure out why this is. They're, they're so close. Right. But they're but just it, not quite exact. And you would expect that that all it just means is that the error bars, like like you can split the difference, right? One is 60, what did you say? It was like 68 and one is 70. Yeah, it's like 68 versus like 72, 72, 73, right? And so, but right. if they're both wrong by plus or minus three, mm -hmm. then you get an overlap. And so the answer is actually somewhere right in between. But right. but the problem, of course, is that the the error bars are too tight. They are They're fairly certain. And, yeah, and so I don't know if you can see Brian. He's doing the, the air bar. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah. The 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 numbers are um are they don't overlap, and so what? what's going on? <laughs> and so this and so this method of measuring with gravitational lensing and, and watching these quasars just provides another measasurement in between. It does. Yes, and so crisis I... resolved. <laughs> We, well, according to them, probably, but um, it's actually kind of funny to look at this from a historical perspective, because when Edwin Hubble first found this, he had a value of 500. So he was measuring the Hubble constant of 500 kilometers per second per megaparsec. And as time has gone on since the 1920s, like the number has steadily dropped and everything's kind of converging. But now there's this little divergence that's popped up. Um, and so, yeah, the appeal of this method then is that when you're trying to use Cepheid variables or supernova, you're using something called this distance ladder, where you're you're building on other measures of distance. So we know how far away a Cepheid is in the Large Magellanic Cloud because we can measure parallaxes, which allow us to build on, you know, if we know some star is so far away because of the parallax, and we can use that to calibrate the Cepheids, which we can use to calibrate the supernovae. 
And you know, if you have one broken step, they all kind of fall apart. This way, you're you're kind of bypassing that, and you're you're just measuring hmm. the Hubble constant. It's the measurements of the angular diameters are directly proportional to the constant, and you bypass that whole step. Oh, that's interesting. Okay, so let's see if I understand this correctly. So, so by measuring, like, how do they know that it is an actual precise measurement? Do they know how big the quasar should be? Do they know how? So you have to do a lot of modeling. That's kind of the one of the tricky parts of this is that you need to have very good observations that allow you to determine exactly how much um, like lensing material there is there. You need to be able to measure the the lens itself very well. And you have to actually find the lenses. There's only like five or 10 of these that we know of. Um, and so if you have a really good model, if you have really good observations, then you can map out what the, what the source actually is that's behind this uh, lensing galaxy. And so one of the cool things about this new study is that it's using um, adaptive optics with Keck. So this 10 meter telescope on Hawaii has really good adaptive optics, which means you can get rid of all the atmospheric blurring. And it's pretty comparable to Hubble, uh, to what Hubble could do. And so this is kind of a new step of how we can do this from the ground. We don't have to go to space to do it. And so what? Um, and so what? What answer did they get for the for their they measured constant, a Hubble Hubble constant? Uh, seventy six point eight, and the old one was seventy four. But it's seventy six point so, eight plus or minus like three. So it's bigger than it uh, was than than the Cepheid variable method. Yeah. So isn't that going in the wrong direction? Yeah. <laughs> right. So it is. So, so what you're saying is the crisis is not averted. The crisis is not, not averted. <laughs> Brian, um, what's your take on that? That that this measurement is, you know, is not helping. It's it's very interesting. I would say give it a bit more time, and you could have the same type of discrepancy that we have between classical and quantum mechanics. It's because the, the thing to keep in mind is that all of these models, although they're model dependent, all of these models are robust. So for example, the supernova is not just a cosmic distance ladder. You can also see the redshift, I mean, I mean the, the Doppler effect from it. So you see a time delay in distant supernovae that you don't see in close ones. And that agrees with that constant. And so you're, you're getting these, these ones that agree, and then you have you know, the, the cosmic background that doesn't agree. But the cosmic background, other things that you see in it that, that depend upon the same model work. So the amount of dark matter, for example, tells you the kind of the, the fluctuations that you would see. And that agrees with the clustering of galaxies and the scale at which galaxies cluster. So, so we have data that matches and overlaps, except for this value. And I would say there's, there's one other test that's coming, which is gravitational waves. Because from merging uh, black holes, if you have a neutron star merging with another neutron star or with a black hole, you get an optical distance and a redshift with that, right. that you correlate with the model for uh, gravitational wave distance. And so you have another way to correlate the, that accuracy. And, and we look at the accurate. that measurement, it like spans neatly both yeah. the 68 and the 74. The, so it's the like ones that they've done you have such huge uncertainties now <laughs> that, that they overlap and agree with both. Yeah. <laughs> it's like Fiddler on the Roof. You have a point. You also have a point. You can't agree with both of them. You have a point as well. <laughs> Um, so, Michael, of the ones right now, uh, which one are you leaning towards? Or is it, are you leaning towards physics? We need new physics. I uh, would not necessarily say we need new physics. Um, I mean, I'm kind of leaning more towards the Hubble. This, this you know, 74 kilometers per kilometers per second per megaparsec, um, just because it seems like so, like we seem to have a really good understanding of, of how all of that should work. 
I, I guess it, maybe it's because of my ignorance. I don't know fully how the CM, how they're doing the calculation for the CMB um, values. Maybe they've got some really fantastic model that I just don't know about. And that's why they're so confident. Yeah. Um, well, I guess, I mean, I, I kind of, I like this. It's funny, like I think we had gotten, you know, back in the day, 10 years ago, um, you know, you asked like, how old's the universe? And the answer was like 13.7 years. And then the Planck mission went up. And then you said, how old's the universe? And now it's like 13.8 plus or minus a few dozen million years. And now it's, it's back into a much more kind of complicated answer. I mean, it's somewhere between 13 and 15 billion years old. And it means you got a lot of avenues for funding too, and proposals. To I guess, yeah, yeah. <laughs> um, so it's theorists I, like this kind of cut. Yeah, I guess <laughs> they do, right? They, 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 they get to now figure out reasons why these things are all different. Exactly. All right, Beth, tell us about the potentially uh, the smallest dwarf planet so far. So uh, speaking of adaptive optics, uh, the European Southern Observatory used their Sphere instrument which is on the Very Large Telescope, great name, uh, to actually image Hygieia and make some calculations from it. And what they found is that it's round, which was unexpected, but means that it, it finally meets all of those requirements. So it orbits the sun, it's not a moon, it hasn't cleared its neighborhood, and it's roughly a spherical shape. So. Um, being that it is only 430 kilometers, uh, that means that it's now smaller than Ceres, which is 950 kilometers. Yes, I have a cat. I have lots of them. They wander. Um, so, uh, I mean, this this picture. I'm just showing off the picture now to the people that are that are watching it. It's astonishing that they were able to get this high quality of a picture. So do you want to talk a little bit about the capabilities of that telescope? So again, it comes down to the, the whole concept of adaptive optics. So basically, um, what adaptive optics does is it gives, um, usually we use a, a laser pointer or some sort of guide star. And then you can actually program the shape of the mirrors to change and it gets rid of all of the vibrations that you would normally see from cloud cover and moisture in the air and you can get much clearer pictures of everything really um, which is amazing for ground-based telescopes because normally you would have to rely on things like Hubble to get these kinds of images so um, it's just being able to change the shape of the mirror and, and keep focused on the same spot so you don't have to deal with all of the little minute changes in, in the air around you. I mean, it really is a, a, a wonderful time in this kind of technology that that you can, you can make a ground based telescope act as if it's out in out in space. Yeah, right. You just get to ignore mostly ignore the atmosphere. There's still some some limitations. So you've got this smallest object Hygieia, how much smaller is it than than Sirius? So so Ceres is 950 kilometers and they they actually measured this while they were doing the, the observations and they think it's about 430 kilometers. So it's pretty small for being a spherical shape. Now there are objects that are smaller than than or bigger than that that don't have a circular shape. In fact, there are dwarf planets. Um, I think which one is it? Haumea? One of there's there's a couple of dwarf planets that are like football shaped. And yeah, and Vesta Vesta isn't uh, circular either. It's actually very oblate. So it's it's an oblate spheroid, but again, it's not actually a sphere. And and did it make dwarf planet status? Uh, I, I don't think I don't think it is. I think it's still considered it just an asteroid. So the rules are all messed up now. Well, the rules are. They were sketchy to begin with, as anyone <laughs> who is a, a fan of Pluto will tell you. Yeah. So, um, you know, they, they just, once upon a time, we used to classify the planets as basically, it was a planet if it was Mercury, Venus, Earth, Mars. There was no definition. It was just these things are planets, and that's how they ruled it. And since then, they've been trying to come up with actual definitions as they find more things. And so, you know, we, we try to classify, and, and even in astronomy, we're a little 
crap at it sometimes. So do they have any theory about why it formed into this very spherical shape? So um, one of the things that they were looking for, so Vesta has this very large impact crater on it. So when they were imaging uh, Hagia, they were trying to find that as well and they didn't see it. So what they, since it's a, it's actually a member of a family, it's the main member of a big group of like 7,000 objects. And what they think happened is that it collided with an object that was between 75 and 150 kilometers wide, the original main body. And then uh, a lot of the pieces just fell back onto Hygieia. So that just became the main spherical piece of it. And then everything else is just sort of fragments out there surrounding it. So Hygieia was the like the main part of this. I mean, I know you get these, you get these families of, of asteroids. And in, in some cases, many of the asteroids in the, in the main asteroid belt all came from one much larger object that got splatted billions of, of years ago. And so, I mean, it's sort of fascinating to think that it took like a really big hit on the chin and then came back into this, into this shape. And they don't see the big impact that must have, must have caused it. No, they think it was a head on collision rather than a, a clip. So it's two objects just absolutely banging right into each other. And then all of the, the biggest pieces kind of came together and formed this one semi, I mean, it's not a very big body, but it's a, a big enough one. So, and then every, the other 7,000 are out there just sort of in a swarm. Yeah. I want to take just a quick moment and, and just like, fanboy on the sphere instrument because it is just a phenomenal uh instrument that's attached to the very large telescope the a lot of the some of the best images that we're seeing of like newly forming planetary systems and and they're all being done with this with this sphere instrument and and it's amazing to think that this is merely the very large telescope while the extremely large telescope is coming in 2026. Brian, you got a chance to visit these telescopes down in Chile? Several of them, yes. Did you get a chance to, did you go to see the very large telescope or were you at yeah. the other one? In, so you yeah, didn't get a chance we, to see that one? No, we didn't see that one. So, but yeah, I mean, they're, they're building up all over the place down there. So <laughs> every time you go down, there's like more telescopes to, to explore. Yeah. Yeah, it's pretty amazing. But, but yeah, it, the adaptive optics and the technology is really allowing us to kind of break through the limit of how big an optical telescope could be. You know, the, the eight meters was kind of the, the largest that you would see. And, and that's because that's kind of about as large as you can make a single piece of, of glass for the mirror. Um, but now you can do multiple layers. You can do, you know, combinations of them that it's really a, a cost limit and a, a computational limit to uh, yeah i mean i had i had read that that you could take a telescope you could take the biggest telescope on earth like a eight meter telescope a 10 meter telescope without adaptive optics and it can't resolve objects any better than a really good backyard telescope something that is like say you had like a meter class telescope because of the atmosphere, the distortions are just overwhelming to a point that you may be able to get more light gathering power, but at the end of the right. day, you're not going to be able to get that resolution without being able to cancel out that. Atmosphere. I think it's about four meters. I think beyond four meters, the atmosphere just doesn't, is not your friend anymore. Yeah. So yeah. You absolutely have to use adaptive optics at that point. Yeah. And that's why all the big observatories have them on board. All right, so we're going to do an interview, and I have no idea whether they're going to splice it in right now or whether they're going to play it after I say goodbye to my co-hosts. But but either way, I have now covered all of my bases, so now I'm going to say goodbye to my co-hosts. Um, Brian, you're on the screen right now. Tell us, uh, sort of shamelessly self-promote something that you're working on and uh, let us know how people can find out more. So you can find me on Twitter at Brian Coberline. You can find me on my website at BrianCoberline.com. And you can find me on Universe Today when, when I get assigned uh, <laughs> new uh, articles. Yeah, I so, should have assigned the wormhole one. Oh, uh, well, well, I'll yeah. talk more about it. But yeah, uh, but yeah so that's those, those are kind of the primary places you can find me. Uh, you'll find some stuff at uh, NRAO when it shows up. 
but uh, that's kind of my main job. Awesome. So, so that's where I am right now. Beth. Uh, you can find me uh, online pretty much everywhere as Planetary Pan. And you can also follow what we do through the SETI Institute. Um, we may have a press release tomorrow. I've been trying to get it out for a couple Is weeks. Is it aliens? So it's not aliens. Oh, okay. <laughs> Hashtag not aliens. All right. Um, okay. So, but that's where you can find me. I will ask me you every week. I know. Yeah. <laughs> um, awesome. All right, Michael, where can people find out more? Uh, so I have a new Twitter account at Michael Roderick. Uh, I haven't it. tweeted much yet, so again, pay attention. And like I said, cool don't worry about it. it. People will follow you. <laughs> Everyone who's who's watching right now, go and follow uh, Michael, Michael's uh, new uh, Twitter handle. And then Sounds good. And don't feel any pressure to tweet. <laughs> it's, uh, you know, it's a time gobbling, uh, yeah, wormhole. So um, now what are you working on? So I actually just got a proposal accepted last week uh, for Gemini. So this is a emitter telescope uh, in Chile. And so we're going to be using it to look at two uh, merging galaxies. And we're going to try to figure out what new stars are being born in these uh, galaxies. So they're merging. You got a bunch of stuff that's getting pulled out. So what new stuff is in there and what old stuff has kind of stuck around from the collision itself. So that'll be, that'll be pretty exciting to start getting data for that. That's awesome. Congratulations. Thank Publisher you. Parish. <laughs> yeah. And the Gemini, that's a that's a good Canadian telescope. So <laughs> and others. You know, other people worked on it. Um yeah. all right, of course, I am Fraser Kane, publisher of Universe Today. Uh we just posted a new video just moments ago about uh new technologies to send rovers to Mar to uh Venus. And we have also just done uh or in the works now is a video all about galactic panspermia, about uh, spreading life from star system to star system. I think I mentioned the research last week, so this is now turning into a uh, into a video. So hopefully you'll enjoy that. Um, all right, well let's get on with the uh, actually you know, before I get on with the interview portion. I think I already said I was going to do the interview portion. So thank you everybody who uh, joined to watch us this week. Thanks to the moderators. Thanks, of course, as always, to Nancy Graziano and the rest of the Weekly Space Hangout crew for helping to organize and herd all of the cats. We couldn't do this without you. Um, I'm going to let bring my co-hosts back, and they're going to say goodbye, but don't leave. There's another 20 minutes coming. So there's everybody there. Thanks, everybody. All right, thanks, Bye. guys. Bye. All right, I'm going to fly solo now. All right, let's get to the interview portion of things here, if I can. Hey, there's me. All right. Here we go. Is that going to work? All right, it's time for the interview portion of the Weekly Space Hangout. And joining me today, I've got uh, Nicholas Cowan and Evelyn McDonald from McGill University, a proper Canadian university, Canada in the house. Uh, Nick and Evelyn, welcome to the Weekly Space Hangout. Thanks for having us. Yeah, thank you. Um, all right, so uh, now I think, I, you know, I recall this story breaking back um, over the summertime, and this was that you had looked at Earth as an exoplanet. Um, so can you sort of explain to us sort of what the, what was the research that you were looking to do and sort of how this all came about? So basically we were finding the transit spectrum for Earth to see what it would look like to a distant observer. And from that, we can know what an Earth-like exoplanet would look like to us if we were seeing it, for example, with the James Webb Space Telescope. So that was the goal. And why, I guess, I mean, we're here on Earth, so we can, of course, see the the state of the atmosphere on, on Earth. Um, would that would that be a difficult observation to make? I mean, you can just go outside and, and sample the atmosphere. So it's a little more complicated than that. We use data from the atmospheric chemistry experiment, which is basically a satellite that orbits the Earth and looks at the sunlight passing through the Earth's atmosphere. So it's similar geometry to an exoplanet in transit, except 
if it's in the Earth case, the satellite is close to the planet, but not on the planet, and the sun is far away. Whereas in the exoplanet case, the planet and the star are basically in the same place, given how far away the observer is. So yeah, so so sort of the the big difference, uh, like to get to your question, Fraser, the reason why you can't just like look at the 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 air above you is that if you do that, you're dominated by the the air that's very close to the surface of the earth because that's where most of the atmosphere is and that has a different composition and different temperature than the stuff that's higher up and so if you look close to the surface of the earth you're getting a lot of water vapor for example um if you if you look at an exoplanet transit you're you're it's like this grazing uh geometry that evelyn was just talking about so the light is just touching the top of the atmosphere of the planet if it goes too deep in the atmosphere you can't see it because it either gets blocked or it gets bent by refraction. So sort of by definition, the light we see from during an exoplanet transit has touched just the upper layers of the atmosphere. Um, and so it turns out you can't do that from the ground for Earth. Right. So even for our own planet, if you want to see what Earth looks like at those upper layers, you need one of these uh, satellites in orbit around the Earth, which which Earth Earth scientists do because they care about things like the ozone layer for example yeah so that's why they look at those data but that, yeah and, and i know that like for example when astronomers like astronomers use occultations all the time they'll they'll observe some star that's passing behind pluto they'll have a chance to take a look at the atmosphere and it's these really rare moments where you get a chance to see these things line up so that you can actually make some kind of observation on the on the atmosphere um and so you you I guess were able to make these observations of the of the atmosphere, Evelyn. What what did you find? Is there life on Earth? Yeah, as it turns out, there is. <laughs> That's and, good to know. And we can tell that it's there by looking at Earth as an exoplanet and from looking at a transit spectrum. In particular, we can see ozone and methane in large quantities at the same time. Normally, those don't both exist in large quantities because they react with each other. So they need to be produced by something and on earth that something is life so we we would hope to see that on another planet as well now the sort of the complexity of finding a biosignature uh, has turned out to be a lot more complicated than I think anybody was ever expecting. Originally, it was like you just find oxygen and then you know there's life, but now we're seeing these natural processes that can produce these kinds of things that we thought would have been biosignatures. Um, Nick, Nick, do you feel confident now that, that there are really telltale biosignatures that you could use to identify that there's life on another planet? So... Uh ish yes ish <laughs> um so you're quite right that if you only detected ozone so like the reason people get excited about ozone is not that we breathe ozone it's that the reason there's ozone is because there's oxygen right so so that's basically that's why everyone makes a big fuss about ozone so um so ozone on its own or oxygen on its own is no longer considered a smoking gun uh, because as you said fraser you get uh, there are other mechanisms to give you that and the most the most horrific version of that is you basically lose an entire ocean worth of water to space by by basically zapping the water molecules, you rip it apart, you lose the hydrogen because it's a really small light molecule and then you're left with oxygen. Um, so there are, there are some pretty nightmare scenarios where you have planets that are really not habitable that would have a lot of oxygen in their atmosphere. We haven't detected any, but the theorists tell us these things should exist. Um, the combination, so, so Evelyn mentioned it was this combination of methane and oxygen. Um, no one has yet come up with a convincing, no one's even come up with a not convincing way to, to get oxygen and methane simultaneously in an atmosphere other than life. Um, theorists, so I have a theorist friend who shall remain unnamed, but he's out on the West Coast, and he assured me that if I gave him a fat enough joint and gave him a, a free afternoon, he could probably dream up a way to get large amounts of oxygen and methane in an atmosphere at the same time without life. So he thinks it's he thinks it's probably possible, but no one's tried very hard, uh, and everyone who's tried has failed. So so for now, that particular combination is still considered a gold standard. Right, right. Um, but I know, like you know, I've done. I sort of. 
uh, naively were like, oh, if you find oxygen, you find ozone, whatever, then you found life. But it sounds like it really is this, this combination of chemicals that you're going to see in the atmosphere at the same time. And that's what's going to then give you much more of a, of a, a representation. Now, um, uh, Evelyn, when you are actually looking at, say, the atmosphere of a, of a planet like Earth, you can sense that these molecules are there, but you can't necessarily know what the ratios are, right? Yeah, the ratios are much harder to know. Um, and other people have studied this and predicted that for example, on one of the Trappist-1 planets whose star is a red dwarf, you would get different ratios. Um, but the important thing is that if, there, if there's enough that we can actually see it in the planet spectrum, that's a good sign. Right, yeah. Um, so then let's talk about like the next step then, right? Which is to, you know, there aren't a lot of instruments right now that can properly image the atmosphere of a planet transiting in front of a, of another star. Um, like there's like Hubble sometimes on the, in the right conditions. Yeah. So what is it going to take? Like now that you've sort of made these calculations and you've proven that earth is, uh, habitable, um, for us to actually be able to look at some of these other stars, what kinds of telescope, what kind of observations are going to be necessary to be able to do this? Well, we showed in our paper that it would be possible to detect some of these molecules with the James Webb Space Telescope once it is available, if you look at the star for long enough while the planet is in transit. Um, it does take a while, but it, it would be possible. Now, when you say a while, like how much a while? It depends what you're looking for and how sure you want to be that you actually see it. Like carbon dioxide would not take that many transits to detect just because it makes a huge spectral feature. Um, something like ozone or methane would be harder. And and, and yeah. the pollution from an industrial civilization even yeah. even harder. Um, now James Webb isn't the only tool that's that's sort of going to be at the disposal of, of astronomers. Um, Nick, what else do you think? You know. If, if you could design your perfect machine, if it's not already under construction, to actually get some kind of observations, what would it look like? Well, James Webb is not not too far, actually, from a dream machine. You could make a supersized James Webb. Yeah, I think it's Habex. Um, yeah, well, or, so or so Habex, Habex and Louvre are, are great, but they don't go to as long wavelengths. So those are, gr those are better if you want to characterize uh, Earth twins, by which I mean like an Earth-like planet orbiting a Sun-like star. But if you're talking about the Trappist system, those don't do much better than James Webb. And in fact, they do a little bit less well because they don't go as far into the infrared. So then, so if you want to do, so there is a, a, the Origin Space Telescope is yet another of these giant uh, space missions being contemplated. Uh, that one is basically a supersized James Webb by some definitions. Um, so that one would be good. The alternative is to basically punt on, how can I put this? In, in, so instead of doing it from space, you try and do it from the ground, yep. right? And you can get a bigger telescope. And Extremely now the large usual, telescope or 30 meter. Yeah, 30 meter telescope yeah. or giant Magellan telescope yeah. or something, right? Now, the usual problem with this is, is you're observing through Earth's atmosphere. So if you're using kind of lowish resolution, uh, spectra like we would get with the James Webb Space Telescope, doing this from the ground and looking at an Earth-like exoplanet is kind of stupid because you're looking through our own atmosphere, which has all the crap that you're trying to detect in the exoplanet atmosphere. So if you detect it, you don't know if it's <laughs> right. in your atmosphere or the other atmosphere. Right. right? It's kind of like you'd be sort of astonished if you didn't see signs of water vapor and ozone and stuff, right? <laughs> right, in between you so, and that exoplanet. Yeah. Yeah. So the 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 trick is how do you get around that from the ground? And the answer is you go to like really, really, really high spectral resolution. And this is something that we can't do from space because these spectrographs are literally the size of a of like a minivan. They're like big. You can't launch that in in, in orbit. And so these really high resolution spectrographs. Um, how they actually resolve individual lines, right? So each of these individual lines is corresponding to some particular uh, rotational and vibrational mode in your molecule. And 
with something like James Webb, they tend to be kind of just smeared together. So you get these what are called bands of absorption. So like there's certain chunks of wavelength that just get eaten out by some molecule. But at very high spectral resolution, you actually make out the individual lines in there. And the cool thing with that is that those individual lines are actually going to be moving because of the Doppler effect. Um, and turns out our atmosphere, if you have a telescope on Earth, our atmosphere doesn't seem to be moving very much compared to that, you know, with respect to that telescope. Whereas the exoplanet is, is it's moving really fast because first of all, it's, it's orbiting around its star. And right. then it, the star it's orbiting around is itself moving in the Milky Way galaxy with respect to the sun. Um, and of course the earth is moving around the sun. And so there's all these different motions. So, so the, the upshot is that the, the spectral lines will be completely different. Right. Locations. So you're going to see the, the, the earth's water vapor, but then you're also going to see a second signal of water vapor that's shifted off because of the Doppler effect going on. Exactly. Right. Yeah. Right. So that's, that's, that's pretty much the crux of the, of the idea. And so people have been doing this so far from the ground with the current generation of telescopes and things that are like three or four, maybe 10 meters uh, across, and we can detect water vapor. Yep. We can detect carbon monoxide. Um, those are pretty much the highlights. Uh, and we can do this for hot Jupiter, so giant hot planets. Right. And so in principle, with something like the 30 meter telescope or the Europeans uh, extremely large telescope, you should be able to push this down to kind of temperate terrestrial planets. And so that's that's the hope. It, it, it gets more complicated than that. It also involves direct imaging. Right, right. <laughs> but uh, let's leave it like that for yeah, now. Yeah, yeah. But, but hopefully the next generation, the stuff coming out in the next 10 years will give astronomers the capability to make some of these observations on the, on the big ones, the close ones, the, the fast ones. And then over time, the observations will be able to get more and more nuanced. Um, so one of the things that really kind of caught my attention with this paper is um, uh, it's by McDonald and uh, Cowan. Uh, so uh, Evelyn, you're the lead author on this paper. How did that happen? Um, it's by a lot of work and by Nick being very patient, basically. Now um, you're, you're, you're a grad, you're, where are you in your educational journey right now? So I wrote the paper as my undergrad thesis. I have now just started grad school. So you had finished your master's degree and now you're getting, you're working on your PhD. Is that right? I'm in a direct entry PhD program. Yeah. So there's no master's degree involved. Right. Tonight. Just go straight into your, to get into your doctorate. Um, yeah. But this is, I mean, this is fairly unconventional, I think, isn't it? To have the, you know, for, to have usually, usually the, the advisor, his name is fairly prominent on the paper. So, um, you know, was this the, uh, did you make the proposal? Uh, Nick, did you suggest it? How did this all come about for you to be able to, to sort of be the lead author on this paper? Um, I well, the project idea itself wasn't mine. I, I came to Nick because I was interested in his work and I wanted to do my undergrad thesis with him and this was the project he proposed to me with the idea that it would hopefully be publishable. So I worked on it with my thesis and then I worked on it for the summer after that to make it into a paper. Yeah. Um, and uh, how have you found the the responses been? Are you you know, are you able to uh, to start booking some James Webb telescope time? Not me. <laughs> <laughs> so for, fortunately, I, I here in Montreal, you know, the, so there's these four instruments on the James Webb Space Telescope, and one of them is Canadian, uh, NIRIS, and um, and uh, NIRIS, the NIRIS instrument. Um, has an instrument mode, a particular mode that was designed like expressly for exoplanet transits. Um, and so maybe unsurprisingly, we have a really large chunk of guaranteed time observations um, with NERIS uh, because I'm, I'm part of the kind of the, the Montreal exoplanet crew who's, who's in charge of NERIS. And so um, once the telescope launches, we're gonna get, I forget how many, hours, but it's like hundreds of hours or something. It's, it's a quite a bit of time we're going to use in guaranteed time. Like we don't even have to compete for it. Right. It's basically time that we get. Right. In Canada return, built right? an instrument. They get to use it for a little bit. Exactly. Yeah. yeah. So we're going to use some of that time to get transit spectra of Trappist planets. Um, 
they're not, we're not gonna stare at them long enough to try and detect something like what Evelyn showed in, in our paper, um, but we'll at least check whether they have an atmosphere. Yeah. Right. Like so far, this is the big problem with red dwarf stars is like the stars are, you know, great. The planets, hey, we find them. There's a lot of them, but we actually don't yet know whether any of them have an atmosphere um, or whether that atmosphere contains any water anymore because they they're at risk of losing all of that early on in their life. So yeah. um, that's kind of the zero order question we want to answer with with James Webb. And so that's part of guarantee time. We're going to be yep. looking at the Chappa system and some other kind of similar systems to just figure out, do these things actually have atmospheres? Right. Uh, well, uh, Nick and Evelyn, thank you so much for taking the time to chat with us today. Uh, it's very exciting. Definitely in our, our wheelhouse. Uh, we're really looking forward to uh, when you do get that observation time because James Webb will launch 100%. It's going to happen. And when it does, it's going to make these observations and we'll finally know if we're alone in the universe. Uh, thank you so much for taking the time to chat with us today. Thank you. Thank you.